because as you can expect, the social media is already bustling with the reactions to the latest inflation data and uh, the numbers uh, from the core inflation uh, this morning from the Bureau of Statistics. We've waited a couple of weeks for these numbers to uh, come out. So, so keep them coming into our uh, Twitter accounts at Channel TV, at Biz Morning, and at B Bolson. Last week, uh, the Nigerian president, uh, Muhammadu Buhari, uh, signed a pact with the United Arab uh, Emirates uh, uh, looking to seize and repatriate corrupt monies back to the country. Uh, part of that uh, deal includes uh, extradition and prosecution of Nigerians who stash illicit funds and property in Dubai or the United Arab Emirates in particular. Uh, the first part of that is also that the, the UAE, uh, under the agreement, can bypass his own uh, courts and instruct the banks there to return monies to the victims of corrupt finance or country of origin, uh, in this case, Nigeria. And that's the first part. The second part of what the president uh, assigned was the Pan-African relations, uh, which uh, basically uh, speaks to the Lake Chad Basin, a very troubled northeast of Nigeria, uh, bordering Cameroon, Central African Republic, Libya, Niger, and Chad, that's about uh, six countries. Uh, that is on the side of security. Uh, that is on one side. Then the African Tax Administration Forum Agreement uh, on mutual assistance in tax matters. Then we have uh, the third part of what the president signed on intellectual uh, property. But let's start this conversation with Dr. Obongo Adi, who is a faculty member at the Lagos Business School. Good morning. Good morning, sir. I hope you had a very nice weekend. Yes, I did. Yes. Uh, when news of this uh, came out last week, the president, let's start with the UAE, as far as illicit funds, uh, corrupt monies, are uh, you in bed with the provisions of this new deal? Um, well, yes. Um, I think it's part of the... Um, the government focus to build uh, strong institutions, and I think that is what we are, what is required at this uh, point in time in our development. Yes, um, uh, talking about building institutions, I think um, um, it's not just about um, you know the formal rules of getting countries to sign into agreements to you know not to allow illicit uh, funds, but the problem here is about the individuals in the country itself and the incentives within the country, you know, because. If you plug uh, one uh, outlet, they may find an uh, alternative. Or dig uh, another one. Another one. So that is it. But um, there is a new book, by the way, by um, um, a Chinese-American uh, uh, business professor, uh, which he called How China Escaped the Poverty Trap. The book is entitled How China Escaped the Poverty Trap. Uh, Yuan Yuan Ang is the name of the professor. And then she is actually turning conventional wisdom on his head. You know, well, on his head, because uh, what she's saying is that, uh, you know, we, we are used to hearing that uh, for countries to develop, they need to develop, you know, grow uh, institutions, have strong institutions, rule of law, governance, and uh, eliminate corruption. Okay. But then, um, by the way, in the case studies she, she covered, Nigeria's Nollywood is included. She's saying that when Nollywood developed, Nigeria didn't have any uh, intellectual property rights uh, protection. So, and which actually sit with some, what some other economists have found, that um, in, uh, when you have weak institutions, markets tend to work because uh, people, businesses begin to do what they call institutional bricolage. They find ways, you know, to subvert some of the limitations that could be, you know, uh, be imposed constraints on businesses. And so one way or the other, businesses work. But then as, as uh, development uh, happens, then there comes a time when institutions really need to be formalized. In the case of Nigeria, we still have the encumbrance of informal system. Uh, our economy is more than 80% informal. Okay, so we don't still have those uh, things, the foundational axioms that would uh, make uh, enforcement uh, very efficient in our system. So it is not about signing agreements, it's about enforcement. It's about signing agreement, about enforcement. Again, uh, is corruption or illegal, illicit flow of funds, is it much about the fact that there is the money is available and folks, uh, bad folks will always find that money? or that we still don't have institutions that make commonwealth possible? Um, again, I go back to what I just said. The challenge of institutions in, you know, in weak societies like ours. Um, let's go to China. In the 80s, corruption was a very pre big problem in China. How did they go about it? Now they begin to give individuals, the bureaucrats, incentive. 
Okay, even today, uh, public wage in China is very low, but performance-based bonuses is very high. Okay, the Chinese government in the 80s, I'm not saying that we should adopt the Chinese <laughs> model, <laughs> the model mm. but the Chinese government in the 80s gave bureaucrats a whole lot of incentive. They gave me a whole lot of money to go find investment, businesses, wherever. Well, and who, then, who are these bureaucrats? Break it down. The, the, the bureaucrats, big boys. the big boys, yes, who work for the government, the people who steal the money. You give them incentive, because right now in Nigeria, um, you were talking about, is it a case of the money being too, I mean, they having the access to the mm -hmm. money or not us having institutions? You can't build institutions. Uh, you can't eliminate corruption because corruption is not something tangible. Corruption is a mental model. It's about expectation. It's not. What I expect other people to do will inform what I do. So it's about incentive. So if you want to eliminate it, it's not about uh, writing rules, writing norms. You can't write norms. Norms evolve. In other words, you need to in incentivize, incentivize folks in the extractive industry. In the extractive in for industries, example, exactly. For NNPC, Ministry of Petroleum Resources, uh, mining. That is very, it's very important. And uh, by the way, I think Nigeria has played into that, in, you know, keyed into that in a certain way. Because if you realize, people who work in the petroleum sector are paid better than those who work in other sectors, like in, 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 in education, for instance. Because you know that these people are you know, very prone to be corrupt. So you need to increase their, you know, their pay a little bit. So give them that incentive. I think we need to think carefully about this. Um, I don't agree that we need to import all this Western model, all the things World Bank says about uh, institutions. And if, especially if you read uh, why nations fell or something like that, you would think mm -hmm. that if mm -hmm. nations don't have mm -hmm. good uh, uh, governance, they don't have rule of law, they don't have all these so-called strong institutions, they will not develop. But let's go back to the beginning of the United States. Okay, how did these strong institutions evolve? It, nobody came with uh, you know, institutions made from heaven. You know, they, they didn't drop from the sky. People started from what they had. Okay? In the case of Singapore, they were lucky to have Lin Kuan Yew, who was, uh, you know, but before then, they had you know, weak institutions. But then they were lucky they had very strong institutions that were uh, bequeathed to them by the British uh, uh, colonial masters. But in our own case, we don't have that. So we have to be more creative about developing our institutions. But being creative and about incentives, how much money could we pay the folks who are on this line? Uh, the anti-grafts uh, campaign is in President Buhari's crosshairs, whether he's chasing the bad guys to the United Arab Emirates or he's chasing them to London or he's chasing them to the United States or he's chasing them all over in Switzerland or wherever. Uh, he's, since he took office, very, very focused.